You know, what is interesting is that steps uh, has been bracketed uh, in its all too short life, I should say, uh, between two un major uncertainties. Just as it was getting off the ground, you had the 2008 financial meltdown. And right now we're in the middle of this massive uncertainty called COVID, you know, uh, with very uncertain outcomes about what the world will look like post COVID. Okay. So it's fitting that, uh, you know, uh, a book on uncertainty and its politics uh, came out uh, just towards the end of it uh, and uh, opens up a whole new avenue and a whole new way of uh, approaching problems. The experience uh, for all of us involved uh, in steps or even casually passing by, uh, it's relevant uh, beyond the immediate. I mean, I'm sure in the workshop, we're going to have lots of talks about uh, the immediate, uh, you know, research uh, output and thinking that came on. But uh, uh, to be uh, the uh, beyond that has been these magnified uncertainties. Uh, that we have grappled with in these uh, 12 to 14 years. Uh, first of all, you know, from the perspective of the global south, what we see is that the age of aid, the age of foreign aid, is sputtering to an end. Okay. It was born after the Second World War and really began the collapse, began with the collapse of the Berlin Wall. Okay. Uh, and it's still collapsing. Just as it is said, the Ottoman Empire is still collapsing. Uh, so, so too is this, uh, the institutions of aid that was set up uh, uh, post-World War II. They did have some significant achievements in the 60s, eradication of malaria. I mean, a whole lot of things have happened, you know, uh, good, bad, indifferent. Okay? But that is all ending. So in the global south right now, we are faced with this massive uncertainty about what is development, how do we go about doing this and uh, uh, everything else. OK, now. Uh, with uh, the uh, with that kind of uncertainty, there's this other one added by climate change. Okay. Now, in my particular case, now climate change has a whole range of things associated with me with it. But let me tell you one simple one that uh, has deep philosophical implications for a hydrotechnical engineer like me. As water engineers, we are trained basically to build dams and embankments and weirs, okay? And how do we do that? We take data of rainfall and stream flow, uh, you know, regress whatever we have till we are blue in the face and then make predictions about once in a 500 year, once in a thousand year flood and, and then design the dam. And there's always this uncertainty. And at some point, some institutional filter comes in and says, you know, beyond that is too improbable. Let's throw it out. OK, now what climate change has basically done is it has told us that future is not going to be like the past. Our rainfall is not going to be like in the past. Our temperatures are not going to be like in the past. OK, so what this means is that the entire methodology of hydrotechnical construction and dam construction and everything else goes out of the window, out. We cannot now design dams based on old data, no matter how much, how old they are. And in the global south, they are measly, let me tell you, you know, where they're being designed. So the idea that we can get certainty from past data to project into a future program is out of the window. And we have absolutely no idea how we're going to go around doing engineering in the future, water engineering in particular, in uh, the age of climate change. Now, what this we are seeing is that we are seeing a new order struggling to be born, you know, and we are too close to those events to really see clearly. Uh, it is said that all the greatest novels, you know, are always written uh, something like 40 or 50 years after the event. Tolstoy wrote his War and Peace 40 years after the Napoleonic Wars. Solzhenitsyn wrote his August 1914, something like 40 years after uh, the First World War. It's 40 years later, and they get better perspective. It's a new generation, distance from the immediate. We don't. We don't have that luxury. You know, we have to think on our toes. But I would argue that you know what the steps experience has taught us is that we can speculate intelligently. We can hypothesize, and after all, that's what good science is. You know, uh, that it's about hypothesis, which is true until falsified. 
So in one sense, life goes on, old order passeth, yielding place to new, said one poet, you know. Now, does conventional hydrotechnical engineering go out of the window, going out of the window means all irrigation stops? No. People are going to continue irrigating, okay. Uh, but how are they going to do it? No more of these very large projects. First of all, the science, the technology will not work probably. But more importantly, the institutions that support these large engineering are also out of the window. The World Banks and all are also under tremendous stress because there isn't that kind of money left anymore. As Glasgow showed, the money that was committed in what 2015 has now been pushed to 2023, you know, leading to a lot of people in the global south asking, is anybody serious? Okay. Now, what will happen with the irrigation? I think a lot of it will have to go now back to traditional irrigation systems. In the hills of Nepal, it's going to be disposable dams, these traditional brushwood dams that were built in the dry season, and when the monsoon came, they got washed off. They still provide about 80% of the irrigation in the hills of Nepal. Now, what will happen probably is people will have to go back to these smaller schemes, take whatever knowledge from high engineering that is available, and see how that can be adapted in these very difficult kind of uh, uh, situations. Okay, uh, This is where I think there's going to be a lot of reliance on what the philosopher of technology, Brian Arthur, calls uh, technological depth and domain diversity in any society. And Global South societies are going to be judged ultimately on that technological depth and domain diversity. It means new educational system. It means new you know, government departments with completely new approaches. It means businesses with new approaches. Okay. Now, we have absolutely no idea what that will be like. For instance, the presence of mobile phones in the hills of Nepal has already meant uh, we, we have more mobile phones, by the way, than, do, than we have toilets in the country. But uh, uh, what this means is that the way we do business, the way we do things is completely changing so fast, nobody knows what this means. Okay, So this leads to this other thing, the rethinking of development and development politics. De decision making, after all, politics is about decision, decision making under tremendous uncertainty. And my personal journey in this decade with together with... Uh, uh, steps coterminous with it has been directly and indirectly uh, affected and uh, also by a process of osmosis through me affected elsewhere. Let me give two examples. Okay, One is within steps. We did bring out this book, uh, Jeremy Alush, uh, who's there, and Carl Middleton from uh, Sussex on water energy food nexus. This is directly a part of the uh, steps work. Now, what is coming out is that this nexus approach is going to be more and more central uh, to this thinking about development. Uh, no longer is it going to be just integrated water resource management or whatever it is. Yeah? It's going to be. And the nexus approach is still controversial. It's a theory in making and so on. But together with it, it turns out that, and this is what my organization, uh, which I used to chair, Nepal Water Conservation Foundation, is also now pushing, which is, you know, looking at food loss, you know, not just as food loss, but as water loss and energy loss as well, and a climate change problem. Because FAO has calculated that food loss globally, if it was a country, would be the third biggest emitter of greenhouse, greenhouse gases. Okay. Now, this changes the way we look at everything, okay? And tied with this idea of nexus now is the centrality of water and energy footprints. We are going to soon have to be able to be judged to, to judge all our products from the shirts we wear to the coffee we drink to the potatoes we fry on its water and energy footprints. Because these are going to be extremely stressed and short items. No, no longer, this means it's no longer going to be the old debates, the old debates of you know, small versus big. It's no longer there. Beautiful is beautiful, small or big. But what is important is small is less risky. So we will probably have to go for less of one massive uh, optimized perfect solution and many equitable, many 10% solutions. How do we do that? We have no idea, but that's going to be the central political fight. And footprints are going to be, it is my growing belief, that it's going to be the banner of new environmentalism in the future. Currently, environmentalism is really sputtering because there is too much procedural fetishism and too little uh, researched activism now. Uh, somehow, 90s was the best period of 
environmentalism, 80s and 90s. Now it's sputtering. But to get back on track, it will have to come back to this idea of the nexus and the idea of uh, uh, the water and energy footprints. Okay. To me also, the other one, which was not directly with steps, but happened at the same time, uh, and uh, much of the work in steps also was reflected in it, is this book that came out, uh, out of Routledge, uh, Aid, Technology and Development, The Lessons from Nepal. Okay. Uh, and this is where we began to examine this whole idea of development, rethinking development, and asking what is bell development, good development, and mal development. Okay. And easily coming to a conclusion that many so-called developments pushed by big agencies turned out to be mal development, whereas some other developments were good developments. Okay. Now, what is good and what is bad is what we begin to examine there with many Nepali scholars and activists and actually practitioners who have actually done good and bad development and learned the lessons. Okay. So what at that same time came and also came through the steps work was this concept that we really have to look at two kinds of science now. Science is, yeah, science is science, you say, though it's not true. There's many different types of science. Who's science? Okay, it's a big one. So we came also with this idea of toad's eye science versus eagle eye science. You know, too little toad's eye science is being done in the global south. Too much of this eagle eye science that seems to have less and less connection to the ground is being pushed. Okay, as a result, we end up with massive maldevelopments. And uh, this is where the questioning is there now. Okay. Uh, so I would wrap up by saying that, you know, one way of assessing the decade and a half effort uh, is not just what questions were asked and answered as good projects do with many that we will discuss in the workshops following, I think, but for practitioners and scientists, what are the new problems it unearthed and what are the new avenues of exploration it opened up? And I think steps can be quite proud on this count that uh, it has opened up uh, uh, as Gordon men uh, 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 Line mentioned, uh, you know, there are new avenues now. It doesn't mean steps, folds and closes. It lives on in the new questions and new research avenues that it has opened up, which will find home in many different uh, institutions. Okay, So as the age of aid ends and a new age of, uh, uh, you know, a reimagined international cooperation struggles to be born, I think steps will find resonances there. So thank you, Steps and Idea Sussex for being a partner in this exploration. Thank you.